It's time for the Spoonie One Wrestling Show. It's time for the Spoonie One Wrestling Show. Oh man, it's easy to fall behind in this kind of work. Um, I don't really have that much to say about Raw. Uh, I was watching Raw, but I was also trying to get Final Fantasy X done because I've got two websites now, and how to weigh your responsibilities between the two. Well, in this case, I really wanted to get Final Fantasy X done because I'm heading out to PAX very soon, and uh, I want to get it done before I go to PAX. So, but I watched it. I didn't take much notes, but really, I didn't need to. Uh, this was a very simple show. And, um... <sighs> The Nexus thing. I'll try to explain in general what happened on, on Raw. At SummerSlam, the Nexus lost their match because, as we all know, John Cena is the last son of Krypton, and even a DDT on a concrete floor will not beat that man. Nexus desperately needed a win. They need all the wins they can get uh, to make themselves look like a credible threat. Because the main problem with the Nexus is that nobody takes them seriously, and nobody should. Um, the main reason for that being is these guys are basically the, the guys who were voted off NXT. And if you ever saw NXT, those guys were immediately exposed as, as being not very good workers. Pardon me, uh, not very good talkers. Um, and not very good, just not very good stars in general, you know. The, these guys really didn't belong in the spotlight. And so, they needed from the beginning to look like a dominant force, uh, something that was threatening, because they were trying really hard going up to SummerSlam to sell these guys as some kind of, like, basically they even called them the most, the most dominant group in wrestling history. I remember, I remember, um, I think it was Grisham, that wasn't Grisham, it was, um, Josh Matthews said that. And, uh... They, they really wanted it to sound like there was something at stake when it came to SummerSlam. Like, if we lose at SummerSlam, Nexus is just going to run rampant over this business. Like, we are going to lose everything. And they were, they were throwing every hyperbole they could, trying to say, like, this, like, if we lose now, if we don't hold the line here, Nexus will just continue to dominate for all time. You know, And, and if it sounds like it's really silly, it's because it was silly. And so, the problem is, to tell an interesting story, Nexus really, really needed to win that match. Shenanigans, cheating, I don't care, but they really needed to look like they could hurt these guys. That they were on equal footing with the rest of the WWE superstars. And that's vital, and it's it destroyed the Nexus at SummerSlam when it turns out that they needed help to eliminate pretty much everybody. You know, they they couldn't eliminate Daniel Bryan without the Miz's help. And even when they had John Cena beaten up by Edge and Jericho, they had Cena beaten up in a two-on-one advantage. And not only did John Cena beat them in a fair two-on-one fight, he crushed them. Like instantly, like they were bugs. Like uh, it was, I think it was Justin. Ga uh, yeah, Justin Gabriel missed his 450 splash. Immediate pinfall. And then no, like it, Wade Barrett didn't last five seconds in the ring with John Cena. Wade Barrett charged him, gets locked in the STFU, stretched him, and taps out. Like that, it was immediately over. So not only did Nexus look like they weren't even, they weren't equals to you know, it, it didn't look like it was a competitive match. It basically looked like they were cheaters, and then in a fair fight, John Cena would just just, just annihilate them completely. Pardon me. Um, so it was it was absolutely vital in this case in Raw that they get some of that back. And so the story was: John Cena comes out, Nexus comes out, and says, "You know, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger." And we lost at SummerSlam, but we we took them to the limit. You know, we beat we beat six of the seven. We went toe to toe, and it was just luck that they edged it out. And tonight, you know, we're going to learn from our mistakes. We're going to be more dominant than ever. John Cena comes out and proceeds to ridicule each and every one of them in turn. And this is precisely what the Nexus did not need: is 
to be told that you know the audience did not need to be told what they already know to reinforce their fears about these guys that they're ridiculous that they can't wrestle that they're not competitive that they're not very good talkers that they're not worthy of being in that ring because the audience pretty much knows that and so the the tale was that the mystery general manager announced that all seven members of the Nexus would compete in singles matches against the seven guys on Team WWE. And um, if any of the Nexus members lost, that they would be kicked out of the group. And that went for Wade Barrett, too. If he lost his match, then he'd be kicked out. Now, here's the problem. And this is, this is compounded... I'll explain why this is a problem in terms of booking, and then I'll explain why it's a why it's a real problem in terms of just common sense. Basically, what happened is Nexus won six of the seven matches, and I say I, I have to put like big air quotes in front of the word "won." They won the matches because um, they won. They all won in such a way, except in one case, where it made the Nexus look like complete jokes that they looked like they were nothing in the ring. For instance, um, Wade Barrett beat Chris Jericho. And actually, Wade Barrett winning, beating Chris Jericho fair, like uh, um, pinning him clean in a match, actually may have done more harm than, uh, than anything. Like, even though he won, we got to see for the second time, really, Wade Barrett's complete lack of wrestling skill in the ring. Uh, he's good on the mic. He talks well. But the man can't wrestle. He just can't. Uh, he got he got beaten instantly, like within a matter of seconds, by John Cena. And you know, Chris Jericho can can drag a pile of shit to a good match, and he couldn't even drag Wade Barrett to a good match, which says a lot. If if Chris Jericho can't carry your ass, that's really sad. He looked bad in the ring here. So even though he won, it didn't look convincing. It didn't look good. And, you know, it, 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 it really undermined Wade Barrett. The victory here undermined Wade Barrett. Everyone else, um, the, the only other convincing win was the tag team match. I think it was Skip Sheffield and Michael Tarver beat Truth and Morrison. And that was the only time they made anyone really look good because Skip Sheffield kicked John Morrison's ass. Like, he really clotheslined the shit out of the guy. And that was like the only time I felt like, wow, they really made those guys look like a threat because they beat up Truth and Morrison, who are two relatively popular guys who are really good wrestlers. The rest of the guys, they they basically did the same finish twice, wherein uh, you know Daniel Bryan was facing off against uh, no, it was it was Daniel Bryan against Michael Tarver, I forget, but it was Daniel Bryan facing somebody, and. They did this thing where the Miz comes down and distracts Daniel Bryan, like the the most basic screw job wrestling finish in history. Daniel Bryan he turns around, he starts shouting down the ropes at the Miz, and oh my God, he comes up and he rolls him from behind and gets the one two three, and Daniel Bryan's been upset and he continues to lose. This this ruined both of these wrestlers because it didn't make the Nexus look threatening. It made him look lucky. It, it, it only reinforced the fact that Daniel Bryan is a loser because he's always lost and he'll continue to lose because I don't know. Seriously, Vince McMahon must hate this motherfucker. I don't, I, I don't know. But, it, you know, when are they going to throw this guy a fucking win at some point? I know he looked good at SummerSlam, but it was like I couldn't believe what they're doing to this guy. I can't believe what they're doing to Daniel Bryan. And they did basically the exact same thing later on. Um... They did. They did a. Geez, they did a countout finish. I remember this one. It was Randy Orton versus uh, Justin Gabriel. Yeah, and it was like Justin Gabriel. It was gonna be Justin Gabriel versus Bret Hart, and the mystery GM said, "I don't want to see Bret. I don't like Bret Hart. I never have, and I never will, and I never want to see Bret Hart wrestle again on TV. So instead of Bret Hart, you're gonna face Randy Orton. So Randy Orton comes out, completely decimates like." Not like I, I doubt Justin Gabriel got a single move of offense in. Treated this guy like he was completely worthless, like he was a complete joke. Um, and what happened eventually was uh, Sheamus comes down and tries to distract Randy Orton. Randy Orton basically just bails out of the ring, forgets the match entirely, and starts fighting with Sheamus. 
And for some reason, the referee doesn't issue a disqualification in this matter. Oh no. He just counts Randy out as he and Sheamus are battling through the ring. And so, it's... Like, technically, Justin Gabriel won by countout. But how bad does that make Gabriel? Like, the entire match he lost in humiliating fashion. Like, just getting completely dominated at every turn. And then, the only reason he lost is because Randy Orton decided that this match was no longer worth fighting and completely ignored him. He wins. There was another match with Edge, where it was uh, Heath Slater versus Edge. And... Um, they were they were outside in the ring, and Heath Slater's up against the steps. Edge is going to spear him into the steel steps at ringside. The, the ref is counting the whole time, by the way, you know, doing the count-out thing. They're doing another count-out finish. Edge runs. Justin Gabriel gets up, sees the spear coming, jumps in the ring, and ducks the count-out. You know? So, Edge gets counted out because Edge is a fucking idiot. And, um, like, you can't even say that... Justin Gabriel, or uh, that Heath Slater was smart. Like, you can't say, like, oh, Heath Slater saw the count coming, outsmarted Edge, and jumped back in the ring to avoid the count out. Like, you can't even give Heath Slater that much credit. Like, he's smart, and so therefore threatening. No, even the announcers pretty much threw this guy under the bus. The announcers were like, I don't know if he knew there was a count out coming. He just saw the spear and wanted to get out of the way of it. So he got lucky. And got a count out. And that's how he won the match. And then, of course, Edge just got pissed off and speared him in the ring anyway. So, not only is he, he, not only is he worthless, he's lucky, and he got beaten up by a complete fucking retard who got counted out because he's stupid. The entire fucking show was like that, where, you know, the, the Nexus guys were winning, but they were winning by, like, count out. They were winning by disqualification. They were just winning by everything except legitimate submission or pinfall. It was pathetic. And so that's why, from a booking standpoint, this was a complete failure. Because these guys have to look threatening. They look like they have to have at least some kind of chance against the WWE guys. And nobody believes that. Nobody really thinks these guys are contenders in any way. Because John Cena can... Like, basically, John Cena could have taken them seven-on-one. You know, this, this is not some kind of... So, you know, John Cena beats Darren Young easily. And so, you know, the Nexus basically destroys him. By the way, how much does that... Like, great baby face in John Cena, where the Nexus starts to surround the ring. They're obviously going to just murder Darren Young in the middle of the ring. And John Cena's like, have fun, you guys. I'm going to stand by and let them just, you know, six on one beat this guy up. Aha! So, I'll explain to you for the second... The, for another reason why this Nexus angle is failing. And it's a very simple reason. Um, you know, I keep saying that Nexus has to look like a threat. They have to look like contenders. They have to look like they're good. You have to put them over. You have to make them look strong. Here's the problem. They're not very good. They suck. In fact, so there's only so long you can fake it there's only so long you can, you know, take these seven really crappy wrestlers and make them look like a legitimate threat. Because as soon as... You can only disguise that for so long. Like, that's why they have them doing these seven-on-one beatdowns. That's why they only have them, like, hitting their finishers and leaving. That's why they only have them backstage just kicking people and not really doing anything. It's because they're green. They're untalented. They're not very good wrestlers. You can't mask that for very long because as soon as you put them in the ring in any kind of prolonged matchup against a talented wrestler, that weakness is going to get exposed and has been exposed. That's like the worst thing they could have possibly done. Win, lose, or draw against the WWE guys, pardon me, was have them in singles matches. Because as soon as you put them in singles matches, people are going to see these matches and go, wow, these guys suck. And that's what happened. So it honestly doesn't matter anymore whether or not you have Nexus win or lose. Because the wins, if they win, no matter what, it's going to be unconvincing. If they lose, it's only going to confirm what everyone thought, is that these guys are losers. And they are. So... They've kind of... It, it's it's really kind of a dismal situation. I don't know how you save this. Like, if you... You know, if you ask me, like, well, no, how would you book this? I don't fucking know. They're in trouble. 
because this Nexus thing has been exposed and exposed big. And the only reason there they were ever any kind of threat was in the seven on one or the six on one beatdowns. I guess they could continue doing that, but the second they ever try to put these guys one on one in a ring, like you know, eventually they're going to do this. They're actually, I think what they've booked for the next week is like a six pack challenge at the pay per view with Wade Barrett, which I guess is the best thing they could possibly do with Wade Barrett, is hide him behind five other talented wrestlers. You know, give him his title shot, but hide him in a match where there's five other dudes, where he doesn't really have to do anything except just get beat up and stomp on people. I guess that's what you do. But again, you're just hiding things. You're just kind of doing, you know, you're kind of doing a three-card Monty with these guys. How long can you shuffle them around in, like, tag matches? How long can you shuffle them around in mass four-corner, like, four-way matches and six-pack challenges? And I, I guess the answer is as long as the Nexus thing has been on because it's failing big time. So that's really all I had to say about Raw was, you know, basically this Nexus thing is, is imploding in on itself. Um... And that leads me to Impact. The much more interesting show, I will concede. But it sucks. It sucks a lot. This show started up with uh, Jeff Hardy kicking the shit out of Abyss backstage. They had this really long brawl. But it, it, it reminded me rather of Mick Foley and The Rock's empty arena brawl. Because they made it very clear that this brawl was taking place um before the impact zone was really open before the crowd had started to filter in so it was like this big brawl um so th there was there was this really funny thing yeah they, like today was saying like jeff hardy is is really mad at abyss like he wants to settle this he wants to get some justice for rob van dam because if you don't remember rob van dam was essentially beaten to beaten into a comatose state by Abyss, who was wielding a board with seven-inch nails driven through it, to the point that he's been hospitalized. And so Jeff Hardy is getting justice for Rob Van Dam. Gee, don't you think this is something the police should be handling? Once again, I, I, I'm not going to harp on this over and over and over again, but when you start actually assaulting people with deadly weapons, this goes beyond wrestling and becomes a crime. This becomes attempted murder. This is something that the police would rather be interested in. This is not something that is believable. It becomes cartoonish. It really becomes just kind of disturbing at some point, and not in that good way where you're like, oh my god, this is wrestling. You know, This is not wrestling. This is just garbage. So, the funny thing about this one was at some point early on in this brawl, Jeff Hardy's pants get pulled like halfway down his ass. So his butt crack is like hanging out there. And so the entire time, the cam like Jeff Hardy for some reason had his ass pointed at the camera like 80% of the time. And so they had this gigantic blur filter over Jeff's ass because his crack, you can see it was just it was hilarious. So there was kind of a there was another funny moment where um, Abyss is choking Jeff Hardy out with an extension cord backstage. Then they cut to the crowd watching the brawl on the monitor. And then they cut right backstage and Jeff Hardy is right back on his feet kicking Abyss's ass like nothing had happened. Like the man got strangled out unconscious with an extension cord. Like five seconds later, he's back. I don't know. Um, so Jeff finally starts to kick Abyss's ass and the two heel security guys, the guys who were like the tag team security dudes pull Jeff away. And by the way, the heel security guys now wield nightsticks. I, I I don't get the heel security wrestlers, I honestly. Um and so Eric like so the the show finally kicks off and Eric Bischoff comes out and he's very serious. He says like in all his 20 years of being in the wrestling business, he's never seen an attack this atrocious. He's never seen violence like this, although, you know, I I I think he was around when somebody hit Hogan with the Hummer. I, I honestly I don't know who got hit with the Hummer, who was driving the Hummer anymore. I think it was Sting or fake Sting. I don't know. I just love referencing the Hummer whenever I can. Um, so he says he's holding Flair entirely responsible for the entire attack on EV2 and the attack on Rob Van Dam. You know, if that were true, maybe we could call the police. Maybe we could. <laughs> ah, I don't know. Suspend. Fortune, um, suspend Ric Flair or fire him or something? Because let's see what we've got now. We've got Rob Van Dam, who, un according to Eric Bischoff, is, quote, 
being held together by stitches, staples, and pins. He's got numerous punctured organs, we're waiting on the condition of his spinal column, and he may have head trauma. We've got EV2 that has been beaten so badly, they've, like, every one of them looks like, like, Wile e. Coyote after he's been dropped off a cliff and he's got like the big exaggerated head bandages and their arms are in slings and they got the black eyes and their lips are bleeding and they got the huge scars on their head. You know, these guys were getting gouged with shards of broken glass. But we're holding Ric Flair entirely responsible by not punishing him in any way! Jesus Christ. So, they say that because Rob is, is worthless now, that uh, they are vacating the World Heavyweight Championship, and now they are holding a single elimination eight-man tournament that will be settled at Bound for Glory two months from now. For two months, we are not going to have a World Heavyweight Champion on this show. It's going to be at Bound for Glory. The pay-per-view after this next pay-per-view, it's all going to be settled. So, he says... The eight contenders are going to be chosen from the top ten contenders list. This makes no sense. Isn't the reason we have a ranked list of ten contenders specifically so we don't need to have a tournament to determine who the champion should be? Shouldn't we go to the number one and number two contenders? for the vacated championship and declare an interim championship between the top two contenders who have been explicitly chosen by some kind of method to avoid a random tournament draw, you've completely invalidated your top ten contender system because you've bypassed it for a tournament system. You've got brackets now. Why are you bothering to count? I don't know. None of this makes any sense. And... And you've got several guys who were in the tournament who are not ranked. They're not in the rankings. Douglas Williams, the X Division champion, is not ranked. You've chosen eight guys for your championship tournament from the contenders list, and one of them at least is not in the contenders list. This gets dumber. Jeff Hardy, the first match was Jeff Hardy versus the freak Rob Terry. This match sucked. Jeff Hardy won. Next. There's footage of Hogan backstage. I wrote down everything he said and I want to read it to you. Because I should I even bother doing the Hogan impression? I've been banged on by the press. You know, I've been drugged through the mud, but you know what? I'm actually thinking about quitting this time. No. RVD was laying in a pool of his own blood. Abyss did it to him. It looked like he was dead. I did not sign up for this, brother. Yeah, he was our whole company. I built the whole company around RVD. And now they're going to have a tournament? To replace the champion? You can't replace RVD, brother. He's like the president. They tried to kill the president or something here. <laughs> Abyss did this. This is part of their plan, whoever they are. I'm thinking about just quitting. I'm done. I don't think I can take this anymore. <laughs> you can't replace RVD. He's like the president. They tried to kill the president or something here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll we have now likened we've likened the the uh, assault on Rob Van Dam a wrestling angle we are equating this now Hulk Hogan Hulk Hogan is equating the attack on Rob Van Dam with an assassination attempt on Barack Obama <laughs> oh. And and you've got Hulk Hogan publicly shitting on the whole 
concept of the tournament. Next match in the tournament. Jay Lethal versus Mr. Anderson. This was an okay match, although Jay Lethal was treated basically like a... This was essentially a squash match. Uh, Anderson essentially kicked his ass the entire time, which I don't like because, one, I don't like Mr. Anderson, and two, I really like Jay Lethal. But I don't know why, but the crowd loves Mr. Anderson. They, the Impact Zone, loves this guy. Loves him. And so, the, the only note I wrote for this match is, there's something to be said about an audience that will gladly chant, We are assholes. At least the TNA fans are honest about it. Anderson wins clean. Madison Rain has cashed in her rematch clause. So, for the knockouts title, it's Pirate Whore versus Madison Rain. Once again, Madison Rain comes out on the motorcycle with the masked biker chick. I simply have to ask. They have finally decided that it is, in fact, a woman. But I have to ask, what does it possibly gain anyone to keep this woman's identity a secret? Okay, I'm, I'm, on, I'm not being fun. I'm, I'm seriously asking you. This biker chick's, her bodyguard's identity is secret. She wears a motorcycle helmet all the fucking time. And what advantage does this gain Madison Rain? I I seriously. I'm way, I I I ser I could spend all night thinking about this like what potential edge does it grant? Like oh no. There's a woman coming and I don't know who it is. So this match sucked. Um, Velvet Sky comes out with Angelina as Angelina's backup because the beautiful people there's a schism now in the beautiful people I couldn't care less um, I wrote Earl Hebner really had to work his ass off to look distracted and not look at the blatant and continuous interference that was going on by the biker chick and uh, Velvet Sky the entire time so like Earl Hebner was looking at everything he was, he was like oh my shoe's untied hey oh what there's a person in the audience who's like causing a disturbance yeah, what? Oh, pinfall! One, two, three! I'm a good ref, you know, like, shit. Um, Flair and Fortune hit the ring. Flair does one of his usual crazy promos. He, he says, EV2 is a circus that dares to call itself wrestling. They don't belong here. The marquee outside says, wrestling. And until one of them can survive a plane crash and walk away. Oh my god. I got reaction on in the background. And Bubba, they, these guys get busted open so bad. Bubba Ray Dudley just pouring blood all over. It's disgusting. Okay, so Ric Flair says, until one of them can survive a fucking plane crash and walk away from it, he doesn't want to hear shit about hardcore. And I was like, that's awesome, Rick. That's cool. I like. I, I really like it. Ric Flair continues to be the most awesome thing on this show, like bar none. Like constantly. Always so good about this show. Honestly, it's almost worth putting up with all this crap just to see Ric Flair go ape shit. Then this immediately just shoots down the toilet, this whole thing, because Dixie Carter comes out. Dixie Carter has to verbally debate Ric Flair. <laughs> she says, oh, I'm sorry, no, I've, I've, I have to go back a little bit. AJ takes the mic and says that this is the house that AJ built. I, st I built this company. I made it what it is. So Dixie comes out and says, AJ may have built this house, but Dixie owns it. Whatever. And so she brings out the ECW guys and says, you know, Hardcore Justice was going to be the last you were ever going to see them. But now that Fortune has gone crazy and started kicking the shit out of people, well, now the ECW guys have contracts. And so... You know, all these beat-up motherfuckers, they come out and they got contracts. And Rick says, There's nothing on my contract says I have to take crap from a woman. <laughs> Rick is awesome. <laughs> and so Tommy says that Dixie, they promised Dixie that they would behave themselves or they'd come right down to the middle of the ring and kick all their asses. And Ric Flair just starts laying on the ground and rolling around, like literally ROFL. Just 
laughing his ass off in the ring because you know what? It really is the that that seriously is like the stupidest, most empty threat that these washed up like forty year olds have ever issued a group of guys in the middle of that ring. Like, yeah, we totally come down and kick these guys half our age's ass. I'm so sure they're scared. Um, Mick Foley. Then Mick Foley takes the stick and he's he starts babbling something about some drunken phone call that Ric Flair made to him a few years ago when he got fired from the WWE and, like, he didn't know what to do and he was crying and, like, I don't know what the fuck they were talking about. And so uh, Mick says he regrets ever bringing Rick into the company. Um, I wrote, I didn't think ECW could get any sadder than when they were being managed by Stephanie McMahon. I really should learn to keep my fucking mouth shut. Because now they're being managed by Dixie Carter. Next match in the tournament. Kurt Angle versus Douglas Williams, the X Division champion. The unranked X Division champion. Against Kurt Angle. For two months. They, about two, two and a half months ago, they started this ranking system. The top ten ranking system. Of all the contenders, in order, of their dominance and win-loss record and coolness in the company, as to avoid confusion, to avoid confusion over who the next contender for the World Heavyweight Championship should be. Now there's a lot of confusion, which is why we're holding this tournament. But, Kurt Angle was ranked number two. Kurt Angle gave up his number two contendership rank because he wanted to fight Every single guy in the top 10 ranking system to prove that he was the greatest wrestler in the world and that he could beat everyone in order to win the World Heavyweight Championship. He beat six guys. Over the course of two months, he beat every guy in order until now. They have now completely discarded the storyline, the great storyline, the only worthwhile thing to come out of the ranking system, by the way. They have thrown it all away and now held this tournament that Kurt Angle is now competing and completely breaking the chain of him fighting his way through the top 10 contenders. It's now all part of a tournament. And now, if Kurt Angle loses the tournament, he will retire. This is beyond stupid. This... There's, there's no thought for long-term booking. There's no thought for convincing storytelling. We ha they have now deliberately and completely wasted over two months of our time. Two months of television, two months of pay-per-views, two months of programming, Kurt Angle's entire character story going into this thing, over. Why? Because they wanted to have a tournament for the World Heavyweight Championship. This is really sad booking. I don't know if this is Vince Russo. I don't know if this is Tommy Dreamer who's had, who has the book now. This is the worst fucking wrestling show in the history of wrestling. And I'm counting Wrestlelicious. This is the worst shit I've ever seen in my life. Doug Williams taps, obviously, because they're not... Can you imagine? This, the, you know, this would almost be so brilliant they should actually do this. Does anyone believe that Kurt Angle is going to lose to Doug fucking Williams? And Doug Williams is a really good wrestler. But, like, they have this, they have the sword of Damocles hanging over Kurt Angle's head. If he loses, he's going to quit. But is there ever any drama in any of these matches that Kurt Angle could lose at any time? No. No. <laughs> no. Oh, God. Sting and Nash come to the ring. Oh, good. Good. I, I was missing this. I was missing Sting and Nash coming to the ring and bitching at Jeff Jarrett about shadow politics in wrestling for like 20 minutes at a time. Never having any fucking clue what these guys are talking about. About how, like, Kevin Nash is a cancer and how he ruined WCW and how Sting is just in it for himself. And just, these guys just repeat themselves over and over and 
over again. So Kevin Nash comes to the ring with Sting. And he says, there's no one he respects more in this business than Sting. And that he's not, you know, the, the reason he's doing this is because he's not in it for the money. He's in it because he loves this fucking business. Since fucking when? He, his character, from the time he joined this company, from the time that Kevin Nash joined up, his entire character was based on the fact that all he cared about was the money. That was the one defining trait of Kevin Nash. That was the one thing you could count on by this man, was that he just was caring about the money. Now he's coming out. Now he's like, I love this business. Fuck you. Fuck Kevin Nash. Fuck the guys who wrote this shit. This is just... It, it deliberately contradicts itself. It deliberately insults our intelligence. Then Jeff Jarrett comes out. And I... I could base I didn't even need to watch this shit. I could have scripted the next 20 minutes out in my fucking head because I've seen this just about every week for the last month. Jeff Jarrett says, "Yeah, th there is a cancer in this business, but it's not in the, it's not backstage, it's you." And the Ke Kevin Nash is like, "Oh yeah, well you're be you like you've been just in it for yourself in the beginning." And like Jeff is like, "Oh, you have." And you know, Sting you got so many skeletons in your closet from the NWO days. I could talk about WCW, but I'm not going to. And Sting is like, I got a bat. And then like, Hogan, and so Jeff Jarrett's like, uh, I'm going to pick up a chair and come to this ring and beat you up. And then Hogan says, you're not going to do it alone, brother. So Hulk Hogan, the guy who was tired of all this shit, who was tired of all the politics, tired of the, the booking shenanigans and tired of Rob Van Dam, the guy he set up to run this company, that he was he said he didn't even know if he could go back in there because he was thinking of quitting. No, no, no. Hulk Hogan, he's like, I'm going to join you, Jeff Jarrett. I'm going to go kick their asses with you. This makes no fucking sense. So, him and Jeff Jarrett, they start stalking to the ring. The man with back surgery, who, who had back surgery a couple weeks ago, probably three weeks ago, he's like, I'm going to go fight fucking Sting and Kevin Nash with Jeff Jarrett. So they get in the ring, lights immediately drop. When they come back, when the lights come back on, everyone is having their, their um, when the lights come back on, Nexus is just killing everybody. Oh wait, did I say Nexus? I meant Fortune. Fortune was beating up everybody in the ring with weapons. Oh, oh my God. You can see why I get confused by this shit. Because, you know, it's just a group of really dominant wrestlers attacking everyone in sight en masse, regardless of babyface, heel, or political affiliations in the ring. You, you can see why I just get a little fucking confused, because Dixie would never rip this shit off from WWE programming. No! EV2 is backstage bitching. They bitch for five minutes. They're bitching about Raven just wanting to attack Fortune. Like they stand a chance anyway. I don't care. Tournament match. Matt Morgan versus the Pope. Pope sets up for the carbon footprint into the ring post. The thing where he kicks the guy's head into the ring post, but the guy really has to cooperate by actually holding his own head against the ring post and, like, standing up and, like, waiting for it. So, Pope moves, hits his backstabber, and pins Morgan clean. Now... Once again, Booking 101, another lesson for you. Most of the time, when you have a wrestling match, there are two kinds of people. There are baby faces, who are the good guys, and there are heels, who are the bad guys. Almost every time you book a wrestling match, you book a bad guy versus a good guy. Sometimes you book a good guy versus a good guy. Sometimes. Like if you're doing a, if you're doing a uh, gimmick where they're trying to find out who the best wrestler is, or it's like a competitive, uh, respectful, honorable match between two wrestlers, you do this. But almost 19 times out of 20, good guy, bad guy. The reason you don't do bad guy, bad guy is because when you do bad guy, bad guy, both guys are bad guys, and nobody in the audience wants to see either guy win. The audience has nobody to cheer for. Okay? You understand that? And so, when you have good guy, good guy, it's also somewhat problematic because the audience wants both guys to win. So you tear the audience apart. You divide them. That's not always a good thing. You want the audience to have a very easy time deciding who to cheer for. 
This is very simple. Now, the Pope has now beaten Matt Morgan. These are the four wrestlers who have now who are now contenders in the semifinals for the World Heavyweight Championship. Mr. Anderson, Kurt Angle, Jeff Hardy, and the Pope. Good guy, good guy, good guy, good guy. Are you seeing a problem here? I do. I'm seeing a big problem. Because now you've got four good guys in your tournament that the audience all wants to win. If you don't see a problem with this, it's because you haven't watched a lot of wrestling. This is very simple booking psychology. You are supposed to have good guys and bad guys fighting each other. And unless you're having someone turn heel, and I really don't think that TNA is smart enough to do that, we are going to have a supremely boring waste of time on our hands for the next two pay-per-views. Besides that, Kurt Angle's winning. Because if he loses, he's going to retire. And once again, TNA ain't that stupid. They're pretty stupid. But they know they're not going to throw Kurt Angle away. AJ Styles versus Tommy Dreamer. Yes, I'm serious. This is the main event of Impact. AJ and Tommy. Once again, this is not for the TV title that AJ has. The TV title that AJ promised to defend every week with honor and distinction. He has now failed to defend it for about three straight weeks. Taz says, if you look up Battle Tested in the Dictionary, you'll see Tommy's face. I'm pretty sure if you looked up Battle Tested in the Dictionary, you won't find anything. Or at least you'll find the word battle. Because Battle Tested is two hyphenated words and is probably not in the dictionary. I obsess over these things way too much. Tommy has it won, but Fortune appears on the ramp, so when Fortune appears, EV2 attacks. After they promised Dixie they wouldn't attack. I don't care anymore. Abyss comes out from under the ring. Since when was he there? He beats up Tommy. AJ wins. Yawn! This show sucks. This show sucks so bad. I tried watching Reaction, and about a quarter of Reaction was Jeff Hardy attacking Abyss backstage again. Um, Jeff Hardy kicks Abyss's ass again, climbs up on a structure, and is going to swanton him through a table, but the heel security guards stop him again, so nothing really gets resolved. Then they start talking, I remember uh, Reaction, Kurt Angle's talking about how much bullshit he thinks... Um, the whole thing where they discard his top 10 contender storyline for the tournament is. I'm with you, Kurt. It's really fucking dumb. But yeah, it's over. Um, tomorrow I'm going to record Final Fantasy X, so the work goes on. But uh, until next time, my friends, Impact continues to suck. And uh, for as long as it does, I'll be here to tell you in how many ways. Oh, Impact, how do you suck? Let me count the ways. <laughs>